tell you how my research started and what the lay of the land was when this theory was developed. Uh, in the late 70s, the 1980s uh, and, and the 90s, there were a number of researchers trying to figure out what is computer-mediated communication. I mean, the question had to do with what's going to happen when we start communicating with each other just through typewritten messages instead of face-to-face -face communication? What's going to be the consequence of not having nonverbal cues, facial expressions, vocal tones, interactional distance, touch, and all those things that we're used to well, when we communicate face-to-face -face or even on the phone. So what happens when we communicate using different channels? What happens when we communicate with hundreds or thousands of people who we have not met before? These were good questions, but each different discipline that approached this question looked at it in a different way. It was kind of like the blind people looking at an elephant, everybody thinks it's a different thing. Some of the original research came out of the field of management science who looked at things in a certain perspective and other research came from social psychology. The field of telecommunications weighed in on the question also, as well as the field of sociology. The, the dominant thinking that came out, the major theoretical frameworks that came out uh, at that time really kind of gathered around uh, a label called social presence theory. These are some of the original articles in the, in the 80s that kind of laid out what contemporary theory and what empirical experiments had, had found about using computer-mediated communication at the time. And I, I think you'll find the idea of social presence theory is, is on the one hand pretty intuitive, on the other hand it might make you scratch your head a little bit. But social presence theory essentially argues that when you, when you have a fewer number of communicative cue systems available to you, nonverbal cues like voice, like uh, uh, facial expressions, touch, gesture, and so forth, the fewer cues you have, the less social presence you experience. Social presence is the feeling of being truly connected with somebody, truly involved with somebody, having a personal connection. And without that, you have impersonal communication. It's more task-oriented, sometimes more hostile, self-absorbed, and so forth. So one summary of the literature said that CMC, that's computer-mediated communication, because of its lack of audio or video cues, will be perceived as impersonal there'll be less socio-emotional content exchanged when people use these typewritten messages. Does this seem intuitive to you? I mean, we, we know natural face-to-face -face is, uh, is, is the way to go. We don't have to think about it. It's very effective. And, and yet, with my own eyes, I saw some things. I had some problems with this pronouncement theoretically, as well as experientially, too. I'm going to show you some historical artifacts here. This is a, a slide I kept from one of the first computer conferences that I had students participate in experimentally. You'll see if you look closely in the top right, this is from September 1988. This is the first message that a, a small group of students working together, the first message that come out of this group. And I don't know if you know the song that I think this is presenting. Do any of you know this? Anybody want to sing it? OK, maybe later. Uh, but you might recognize that this person has somehow found a way to imbue the, the, the title, the subject line of the message with singing. I mean, this just doesn't connect with social presence theory that says when it's a typewritten message without nonverbal cues, there's going to be no emotional expression, no charisma, and no personality. Hi, this is user 12. It's great to be meeting you all, whoever you are. Please introduce yourself sometime by anonymous name only, of course. They had to be anonymous in this. And it ends with, uh, great to meet you all, hasta luego. So I see personality in this, and this, this is not consistent with the dominant theories at the time. Th this is a message that uh, uh, was uh, sent via corporate email uh, where, where uh, my wife was working at the time. And it's a, it's a message of gossip. It's a message of secrecy, and it looks like it's a message of affection, too. And, and even back in the 80s, they knew about multiple exc exclamation points. I think they invented that in the 80s. Here's another message from before your time. This is ASCII, ASCII art, uh, and, and this, this is somebody accepting a marriage proposal in, in, a, in a public on, online discussion board. So we have a whole lot more stuff now. We have emojis, we have emoticons, we have pictures we can send to us, we can have video, we have video that we can send to us. But what's always fascinated me is how people become expressive when they're restricted to the most minimal cues. And in some case, even become more expressive, more affectionate, 
like each other more are maybe even more attracted to each other online using just text and language than they might be offline. But the dominant theories of the 1980s and 1990s didn't have an explanation for that. So I kind of had to go back to the drawing board. And, uh, uh, and I come from a perspective on interpersonal communication. I think a lot of times people think, well, that's how romantic couples form their relationships, how families argue. And it is that, but it's a lot more. It's the study of how people relate, how people do use different cues to form impressions, manage relationships with each other. And from that perspective, a, a different theoretical model emerged. And that was the hyperpersonal communication model. It's a model that tries to explain how people using CMC or computer mediated communication develop heightened affection for one another uh, over time. And, and there's four basic elements to the model. And the four basic elements are the four basic elements you would see in any model of communication. They're just kind of twisted a little bit in ways that uh, happen when we go online using text-based communication. So the basic elements are the, the sender, the receiver, the channel, and the feedback. This is how we always talk about communication. But the question is, what happens to each of these elements once they go online? Let's start with receivers. You're a communication receiver when you get a message from another person. And in plain text uh, CMC, I think uh, in many cases there's an idealization of the partner when you get a message from somebody. If you experience any kind of similarity or liking to, uh, about the person from whom you get a message, I mean, on first encounter, you're watching them post on Facebook or you get an email message from somebody. If you like them at all, you think you might be like them in some way, then because there's no nonverbal cues that differentiate or denigrate that kind of impression, we tend to over-exaggerate how much we like them. So when there is an overestimation of what they're like and how similar they are to us, that tends to increase attraction. So this is kind of a cognitive process that we undergo when we get a favorable message from somebody else. Of course, when we get a message, we send a message. So what happens from the sender perspective? What's the hyperpersonal perspective on message sending in CMC? In this case, we talk about a process called selective self-presentation. And we selectively present ourselves in like many facets of life job interviews, meeting somebody for the first time, and so forth. But you have some affordances using CMC that you don't have face-to-face. -face. You have an opportunity for a mindful, more mindful construction of your desired message. You can think about what you want to say. You can focus about what you want to say in such a way that puts you in, the, in your best light or that quirky way that you really want to be perceived. Whatever characteristic you want to develop, you can probably express that more when you can engage in the online process of, of composition. There's no nonverbal leakage of, of non-preferable uh, information about you. So when I'm online, I don't have to hold in my waist. I don't have to worry about my hairline getting thin and, and stuff like that. The stuff that you don't want to go out doesn't go out. How does the channel facilitate the hyperpersonal process? Well, the communication channel in CMC gives people really cool ways to make their messages uh, more effective also. First of all, you have discretionary engagement. You engage in CMC when you have the time, when you feel like it, when you can take time away from other activities that might rush you to work on CMC and work on Facebook, work on social media, when you have the time and when you feel like it. So that's discretionary. You have a ability to reallocate your, your attention from monitoring the environment into the message that you're creating. So, so right now we have to be sensitive to what, I, I have to be sensitive to, to the lights. I have to see if people are, are making noises and you're trying to see if somebody walks in the room, you'll notice that. We always have to scan the environment in any face-to-face -face setting. When you're online, there is no outside environment to scan. There's just the screen in front of you that you can focus on and you can use that mental energy to tailor the message to make that message just what you want it to be. If there's an interruption, you go away from the keyboard, you come back and make the message what you want when you can. Another aspect of the, of the channel is this freedom to compose the message. We've done some studies that show some people take longer composing messages online to people who they think are gonna be more desirable than people who they, who, uh, they think will not be. So there's message composition 
uh, attributes. And finally, there's the editing capability. You can, even, even when you're texting, if you don't like the way something came out, you just erase it and start over till the message is just the way you see. So with the channel, uh, the channel helping you make messages the way you want, your selective self-presentation as a sender composing messages, and this idealized picture you might have of somebody without any information that they're not as good as you think they are, you've got a pretty great environment for sending and receiving online messages. But you don't do each of these in isolation. The feedback process, that's the fourth dimension, the feedback process kind of creates a reciprocal spiral on this. In, in human communication of any kind, online or off, we know that there's self-fulfilling prophecies. If you have an expectation that somebody you're communicating online is really witty or really funny or really cool or really attractive, if that's your expectation, you're liable to communicate with that person in such a way that reinforces that expectation, not only to you, but makes them behave that way also. And with all these affordances of CMC to help you, we should see those self-fulfilling prophecies pan out. Our perceptions lead to reciprocal influences, and that heightens the experience more. Ultimately, we end up transforming both ourselves and our communication partners through CMC. And I'm, I'm saying this is not just in email and the 1980s and 90s systems. I'm saying you do this when you're texting people, when you're using the, that language, to use abbreviations that only you and your partner know. When you're trying to get acquainted with a professor you haven't met before and you put on really polite or very personal messages and the person responds, you've got a cool relationship starting that might have been more nervous, more difficult for you to do on a face-to-face -face basis. That's the hyper-personal model. But one important dimension is that this happens over time. Because online communication, the typing, the reading, the lags, the, de the delays in replying, that takes time. So these these dynamics that occur, they don't happen as fast as they do in face-to-face in -face communication. They happen sometimes better, but it takes time for them to take effect. That's basically the hyperpersonal model, the self-fulfilling prophecies, perceptions, reciprocal influences, all these things that take place over time. Let me tell you about a couple of experiments, some old, an old one and a, and a newer one that we used to, to see if this model had any merit, see if it had any validity. This one we called, is a picture worth a thousand words? And we compared photos versus text in long-term and short-term computer-mediated communication. And to do this experiment, we did this in the, in the 90s. Uh, we tested two theories at the same time. We tested social presence theory, which I explained to you suggests that the more cue systems you have, the better the interpersonal communication will be. Implication of that theory, if you want people to get along well with each other and like with each other, because CMC has few cues, it should lead to impersonal interaction. So what do you do? Give people more cues. Give them a picture. Give them audio. Give them something if they can't meet face to face. The hyperpersonal model says really the opposite. It says that people get along better when they don't have when they have only language through long-term repeated uh, text-based interactions. They get along better with each other. So what's the implication? If you want communication to be better, add time to text-based interactions. How we tested that was this. This, was, this took all semester to do. This is when I was teaching at, at Northwestern University. But I was also, I had left Northwestern to spend a semester in England at University of Manchester. And we set up a course where the students worked together in small groups. And they worked together all semester long on a series of projects. And either of those groups stayed together all semester long or as soon as they finished one project, we'd switch them into a new group. So by the end of the semester, we had semester-long teams who were now facing their final project, or we had new teams. They had no past together. They had no future together. We're at the end of the semester. So you, you're either assigned into a long-term team you've been working with or into a new team you've never worked with before. And half of those teams in each of the conditions, and these are four-person groups. Sometimes we had some three-person groups. Half of them, before they engaged in this last task, we showed them pictures of each other, and in the other half we didn't. So it's a simple, classic experiment with uh, control conditions and so forth. But, but to, to remind you of this situation, put yourself in this situation, you might have been one of these people you've been working all semester with, with uh, partners in another country. You've never seen them, and now we're going to show you a picture of what that person looked like. Social presence theory says this is going to be a good day for you. Hyperpersonal theory says maybe not so much. 
And let me show you what the instructions looked like, because the last task that they had was just an online decision-making chat. And, and we gave them this instruction via web pages that was connected to an international chat room. So here's one condition. You'll be working with these people. Here's their names. Log into this chat room. Go to this private chat space, uh, and you can work on the decision there. So this is the instruction for one of the conditions. Here's the instruction for the other of the conditions. Here's the people you'll be working with. And you see their photos. Either they're strangers to you or these people you've been working with for a long time. Go into the chat room, have your discussion. We had them fill out questionnaires at the end that had them rate their communication partners, had them rate their interpersonal communication, their level of affection, and so forth. And here's the results that we got on that. And these results supported, supported both theories. Even though the theories are contradictory, we set up the experiment so we could see if both theories had merit. And what you see on this from the, from the blue, well, let's start with the, the green line first. This is, this is the short-term groups. These never interacted before. They never interacted with each other. They never will again. And when they didn't have a photo, they had no other information. They were strangers and had to work together. That's the bottom left corner. They didn't like it. They didn't particularly like each other. There were low scores on affection no, uh, and low scores on liking to each other. But if you gave them a photo, now we're in the middle on the right. If you gave them a photo, they liked each other better. They got a sense of who they were working with. But we got the opposite effect on the long-term groups. These are the folks who've been communicating with each other just through text-based messages all semester long. And on, on the right side, uh, on, on, on the far left side, top left, as long as these people didn't see each other, they continued to really like each other. They, they built these hyperpersonal relationships over the course of weeks and weeks. You show them what they really look like, and that level of affection and liking declines back to a normal level. So th th this, this is why you don't want to spend too much time using an online dating application chatting with a prospective date. You, you want to go to the coffee shop and meet that person right away. Otherwise, it's, it's love you'll never, you'll never uh, uh, reality will never measure up to. So this is an experiment from the 90s, but we've, we've replicated what happens to CMC and the hyperpersonal model in the decades since. And this one is a more recent study. This was prompted by the notion that now with the modern web and modern chat applications and platforms, the things that used to be in the mass media, the information that were in the mass media, you'd have to either read in the paper, see live on TV. That stuff's available to us all the time. Mass media information is persistent now. And so are interpersonal sources available to us all the, all the time. And we wanted to know if the hyperpersonal model helps us think about how people use persistent information for persistent interpersonal relations. And we did an experiment about that looked at the way that relational goals might drive the way people select media content and what the effect of that would, would be. Our questions had to do with, do their relational goals guide their use of information and the way they argue and talk to each other about things? Do those arguments affect their self-perception and their attitudes, both about things and people? I know that's a little abstract. But let me tell you how we did the study, and then I'll tell you what we found. It'll become a little more concrete to you. For this experiment, we brought people into our laboratory two at a time. But we, I'm sorry, we brought two people in at the same time, but separately from one another. We put them in separate rooms so they never saw each other before they would have an, they never saw each other, period. Uh, and then we gave some instructions. First, we had them rank, rank and rate the best hamburgers in the area. Why hamburgers? Because everybody has an opinion about it, but nobody cares too much about those opinions. We wanted a topic everybody would have an opinion about, but it wouldn't be too hard to change. So please rate and rank the hamburgers in the area and write your name at the top of this sheet. And then we swapped those sheets from the two participants so they could see the name and the preferences that the other person indicated. Then we went to one of the two people, and only one, and we gave them an assignment. We said, what we want you to do when you have a chat with that person in 10 minutes is first we gave some of them an affinity assignment. We said, Act like you really like that person and try to get that person to like you too. Do whatever it takes to get them to like you without making it obvious that we gave this instruction. Do you have any questions about what to do? Nobody ever had a question. 
or we went to one of the two people in the, the dyadic couple. And we said, we want you to do something as this experiment. You're going to have a chat with the other person, computer chat in 10 minutes, text-based chat. We want you to act after the first minute like you really decided you don't like this person and you hope you never have to interact with them again. We want them to repel you so that they would never want to communicate with you. Get them not to like you. Do whatever you want to do and do whatever you can do without making it obvious that we told you to do this. Do you have any questions? Nobody asked us any questions. People felt like they knew how to do this. So that's the affinity prompt or the disaffinity prompt that we use to make somebody our confederate in this experiment for the time being. Then there's 10 minutes before they start their chat with one another. We said, you have 10 minutes to prepare. And we watched what they did during that 10 minutes. And then we had them do a, a chat, uh, doing a, in a chat room over a CMC for 10 minutes. Then we had them rate each other on their desirability and attractiveness. So how much would you like to be friends with this person? And how good looking do you think they are, among other things? And we had them rate the hamburgers again. Now, our purposes may not be too clear, but when I tell you the results, maybe it'll come into a little bit better focus. Our analysis helped us answer these questions. Do people look up the partner? Because we're aware that, that media have changed. We wanted to know, do people use face, Facebook to, to look up their partner online? And we found there was no difference on Facebook seeking, Facebook using, either among the people who we gave these goals or the people who had no goals. They didn't look each other up very much at all, which surprised us, but they didn't. The people we gave these Confederate instructions to, they tended to use Google more than the naive subject and to look up, uh, uh, to look up various things. They looked up, uh, some of them who had the disaffinity goal, looked up how do, you, how, do you, how do you act like a jerk to somebody online. They used other language. I won't bother to repeat it here also. But another question we had is when they were Googling, when they were looking things up, did people look for information about the other person's hamburgers? And the answer was yes. And this is what we thought might be happening with this convergence of persistent mass media information and, and the, the imminent interpersonal encounter. We thought, are they going to look up stuff about burgers to be able to have this conversation about? And we found those with the disaffinity goal did look up the other person's favorite burger most often than anything else. They're looking up how much fat does it have, how unhealthy is it, other stuff they can use as ammunition in their conversation. Looking at the conversation they had at that 10 minute chat, we got, got some information out of that too. We supported our, our hypothesis that the Confederates will use more arguments uh, the Confederates who either agree or disagree, they're going to use more arguments, state more agreements, or state more disagreements about burgers with the other partner. And yes, they said they did, and we saw it in the transcripts of their conversations too. So again, we asked them, get this other person to like you or dislike you. And they did it by going after their favorite burger. Do the Confederates' expressions affect their own burger attitudes? And this was in that post-test questionnaire where he had them rate their own favorite burgers again. And sure enough, all the Confederates' burgers' preference changed. And it correlated, their change in preference correlated with the number of arguments. In other words, if you tried to get your online partner to dislike you, to give them all the reasons that, that McDonald's sucks because they said they like McDonald's, your attitude toward McDonald's went down by you having done so. You convinced yourself that your attitude changes. That's that self-transformation aspect of the hyperpersonal model. And we found, not entirely expected, but we found these most fascinating results too. <laughs> that the arguments and the form of conversation that these Confederates had with their partners affected their perceptions of the partners as well. So the, the amount of agreements that one of these Confederates expressed correlated with their, partner, with their ratings of their partner's desirability and attractiveness. I mean, they never saw each other. They're in separate rooms using a chat program. But the more that one of the more one of them might have said, um, I, I agree, tastes great, um, really well prepared, always good variety, good sized portions. The more they said things like that, the better to you, the better looking they thought you were. When they agreed with you, they thought you were prettier just by them having said it. Positive arguments correlated with ratings of the partner's desirability, and disagreements correlated negatively with ratings of the partner's social desirability. So the more I disagree with you, 
the uglier and the less interesting you get. You didn't do anything. But by me having typed that, it changed the dynamic of the conversation. And of course, they didn't like each other as much, uh, nor did they like the burgers as much. Now, our interpretation of this research is, is quite, quite a departure and quite an extension of the hyperpersonal model. But we've seen now that relational goals affect the way people search media. The relational goals that people have affect their appropriation of information, the way they argue with each other, the way they discuss things with each other. That affects their perceptions of their partners. It affects their own attitudes. And we think this is enabled by persistent media and the use of verbal strategies online. Because if I tried to disrespect you and put you off face to face, it would be through indirect body orientation, a minimization of eye contact, negation, and stuff like this. But it's not on record. It's ephemeral. When I type it out, it influences you, and it influences me, and it influences the way I regard you as well. Because it's language, and it's durable, and it persists. These things are more powerful sometimes than a face-to-face -face conversation would render. Well, I don't have that much time left. Here's one implication of this. Because we were asked, well, what is the implication of all this theoretical stuff? And we said, well, here's another one. For instance, you go on an online dating site, perhaps. You, you look up some profile of, of somebody who looks interesting to you. And he's got this dog. You don't know anything about that kind of dog. So you Google something about that kind of dog. And you find that that dog is, has even temper, is easily trained is a good companion. Next time you chat with this guy you're trying to date, you can say, I love that kind of dog. They're so even tempered. They're so easily trained. Next thing you know, you love that kind of dog. So we think this is at least one real world application of these self transforming and partner transforming effects that come out of the hyperpersonal model. Let me leave you just with a basic communication model and tell you this is where I started asking the question, how does online communication kind of mess up the normal dynamics that we've studied so carefully over decades and centuries about face-to-face -face communication? There's still a lot to learn about this. And this isn't a, a STEM subject per se, but uh, you know, I, I can't understand what I understand without understanding some of the engineering, uh, or at least some of the affordances of the systems that people are using so commonly for communication nowadays. If any of you and I, you know, I've got the lights in my eyes. I can't tell of you. I can't tell which of you were using your devices during the talk. But I'd, I'd be willing to bet it, it wasn't to watch YouTube and it, it wasn't to look at something static. If you were, if you were, if you were looking at that, it was to get a message from someone, to reply to a message from some someone, because these these things are like water and air to us. And now the devices make it happen all the time. There's an attraction to it that that we didn't used to have quite as strongly before. For some, time, some it's a problem, for sometimes it's not. But it sure is a phenomenon worth studying. I hope I've been able to interest you in this topic. If you, uh, uh, the, the Center for Information Technology and Society does research into this and just a whole lot of other things, from engineering to environmental science, communication, political science, uh, English and writing. We do lots of things. Please look up the CITS website at citsucsb.edu. Look me up if you like, and I'd be glad to answer your questions for a while. Thanks for listening so carefully. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks a lot.